Okay, thank you, Chris. Good to be with you this morning. And we're going to dive right into talking about those unwanted plants called weeds. And um, what I'm going to try to give you is just some more over, because of the time limitations and so forth, I'll give you some general overall thoughts and perceptions about how we deal with different weed problems in these grass pasture areas. And then wrap it up with some more specific uh, research that I got involved with a few years ago where we looked at some of these different practices and how they impact uh, weeds and forage productivity. So with that said, I thought I'd start with though is uh, kind of defining what the problems are. In fact, I just finished up a survey with our county ag agents around the state and asked them to basically list the top five weeds that they feel like are impacting pastures in their county, and then rank them one to five. Well, they came up with 32 different weed species in their list. Is that a surprise? There's a lots of different ones out there. So what I've compiled here is what's kind of the top 10 or 11 species and the percent of times in which those weeds were mentioned. So what you see on the le left, that percentage represents whether it occurred within that Five, five species that they indicate overall, okay? What's in the brackets over the right of that species is the number of times it was the first one listed. So what came to the top of the list? Buttercup. Well, the other thing here, I put an up arrow on that because I did a similar survey back in 09, and so that species has gone up the list. At least there's more concern about buttercup overall, I think, around the state than it was even when I first started. We didn't talk about buttercup that much. But it's uh, kind of the top of the list. Then falls in tall ironweed. Uh, that was the number one on the list back about 12 years ago. My percent of times indicated, though, has, cha has not changed. So it's still a very common species problematic species, if you will, in our grass pasture fields. Then we have spiny amaranth uh, or pigweed, cocklebur, common ragweed, some summer annual species that are pretty high on that list. Thistles have dropped, and thistles are primarily dealing with musk or nodding thistle, although many of you know we do have some other thistles, like bull thistle, uh, which is another biennial thistle. And when we get into this area of the state, we see a little more Canada thistle which is a true perennial. And how do you tell them apart? Well, you've got to, if you dig it up and you see plants connected underground by roots, you've probably got Canada thistle that you're dealing with. <clears throat> then poison hemlock is coming up on the list. Horse nettle is staying the same. And three species that were not in my top 10 or so on the previous list were foxtail, chicory, and curly dock, as indicated being uh, pretty above at least 15% uh, of uh, times mentioned. So that's kind of some of the weeds that, that are out there. But I also asked them why weeds are controlled. Now I did give them a little prompting on what some of those might be. And the percent of times in which weeds reduce yield and carrying capacity was right at the top of that list. Aesthetics was a little higher than I thought, but I think aesthetics is a reason that some people control unwanted plants. Uh, we kind of want things to look good. This concern about poisonous plants was actually higher than I, my own perception would have been, but apparently individuals are concerned about uh, some of those poisonous plants out there, and that may be inherently due to the poison hemlock on the increase. Reducing forage quality and we get rid of weeds because the animals did not eat them. All right, so do weeds impact forage yield and subsequently impact our carrying capacity on some of these pastures? This is a little, little project I did in Lewis County a few years back. And the photo you're looking at is one year after this study was initiated. This was happened to be a field that had a I would say a moderate to heavy infestation of tall ironweed and a few other residual weeds, but 
specifically tall iron weed. And we went in and sprayed replicated strips and then untreated strips. We only had two treatments, one sprayed, one unsprayed. And we came in and took some little subsamples out of each of those strips and separated out the weeds from the grasses. Brought them back, dried them down, and then calculated the, the pounds of dry matter produced from that one sampling time. And that was again occurred one year after treatment. Now this field was also in a rotational grazing system. So animals were still, I had access, but the animals were taken out a few weeks before we collected our samples so that we could have the biomass to, to look at. So what did we find? Total biomass, which is everything collected within the sample area, here's the untreated and here's the treated and we happen to use Grazon next as our, our treatment. Yeah, it looks like there's a difference. Technically there's no difference in the total biomass produced, whether we sprayed or didn't spray. But if you look at the forage grasses, was about a thousand pounds of dry matter produced where we did not treat, where we made the herbicide application, it basically doubled the amount of grass in those areas. Where's the difference? Right here. This one weed in particular is taking up a lot of the productivity, if you will, vegetative productivity from that particular area. Now it gets one site, one study, not all fields are going to respond this way. Not all weeds are going to have that same effect, but at least in that one case, we see a pretty dramatic, dramatic uh, difference. And there's a little bit of horse nettle that we measured as well. So another question I asked the ag agents is why weeds are not controlled? Because most fields have some weeds in them, right? Some fields have a little more attention for weed control than others. And they indicated that low management, low or poor management is probably the best indicator of, uh, or management in general may be the, the factor here that's, that's, that's driving that. But still the number one at the top of the list indicated is don't kill clover. That interferes, clover with, interferes with weed control or vice versa. Right? And that's indicated here. Uh, herbicide's too expensive and spray equipment limitations. So if we use spraying as a, a tool in the toolbox, uh, that was pretty high on the list. Lack of time uh, is reality. We have a lot of things going on. And I'm afraid weed control is probably one of the last things we think about until we see a major problem uh, is, is kind of my view on that. And there, granted, there's land topography constraints. We have some land resources where we're grazing animals that I don't care what you do, you're not going to change some of those variables very easily. It's going to take a lot more inputs, and some things uh, are not as conducive for management. Then mowing too expensive, grazing restriction with herbicides uh, was also on the list um, as well. So getting back to weeds and their impact, I think I hopefully have illustrated that, yeah, indeed, weeds do impact the, uh, the quantity or the carrying capacity, if you will, of some of our pastures. But I also would argue that it can also impact the forage stand life. Over time, those weeds, as they occupy space, also are impacting some of those desirable species. And they do have an impact on the quality or the palatability. And we also have to be aware of they are potentially poisonous plants that we need to be concerned about. Now, having said that, I also know and recognize that a lot of animals tend to avoid these poisonous plants in many situations. But if they don't have anything else to utilize or have limitations, then they're going to be more prone to exposure and then subsequently problems. So that's kind of defined the problem. So what are the tools in the toolbox to deal with unwanted plants or weeds in grass pastures? Here's my kind of quick list. Unlike if I was talking to a grain crop audience, the main tool in the toolbox is what? 
herbicides or chemical control. Well, I think in forage systems, we've got other tools in the toolbox that are just as important, if not sometimes more important than just the herbicide availability. And that is cultural practices, mechanical control options uh, come into play. And I'm going to talk about these three a little bit more in detail in a minute, but there's some biological control agents. Uh, we have an insect that helps us on must thistle uh, control, and that's been a success story in my opinion. It was released back in the late 70s whenever they were first released in Kentucky. In itself, that insect hasn't gotten rid of those thistles, but it has helped us reduce seed production. And you could argue a little bit that the animals themselves serve a little bit as a control agent, uh, as well as if you want to inter intergraze goats with cattle. Goats graze preferentially different than cattle. And then other one that's kind of the back burner a lot of times, but should be at the front of the list, is prevention. Again, when do, you, when, do, when do we see weed problems? When they're highly visible, after the problem's kind of progressed until it's gotten to the point we've got to do something drastic. But if we can recognize some of these problems early on <clears throat> and prevent them from getting to be bigger issues, then we're, we're moving in the right direction. <clears throat> so let's back up and talk about three of those a little more in detail. One in particular is cultural practices. And this is my opinion, but I think cultural practices, and that is the things that we do or the things that we don't do in how we manage our, our forages and our livestock systems, uh, is at least 60% or so of weed control. You know, I've got proper fertility and soil pH levels, and Dr. Grove is going to dive into that a little bit here in a few minutes uh, and discuss uh, that element of it. Improving forage stands or sometimes doing some interseeding. Basically what I'm getting at is those things that promotes the growth and the health of the desirable species helps compete against those unwanted plants. And what can we do to, to help keep that advantage more towards those desirable plants. Now, I also have to admit, we can do a lot of right things in that direction, and there's one thing we have no control over, and that's the environment, and even the annual environment. We have dry years, and we have years more in place like this year. Some of the questions we've had this summer have differed than we have in a dry year because we're seeing some things more prominent this year that you wouldn't see in a more uh, normal year. One of the big ones in that, what I, under my category of cultural practices is grazing practices. And you all know this all too well, even better than I do. Spring of the year, we've got more forages than we have cattle out there, right? But they're still starting to selectively graze what they like and leave what they don't like. But as we move into those summer months, we didn't see this as much this year, maybe a few areas of the state, and they really become selective and take out what they don't like and leave what they don't, uh, they take what they like, leave what they don't like. And as a result, these unwanted plants have more of an opportunity to reproduce and to continue to propagate and become more problem with time because we have no little or no competition and that's inherent with our cool season based uh, forage systems. But grazing basically is selective, defo selective defoliation. It's selection. It's selection pressure. And it allows those undesirable species to become much more prominent with time. Um, and it shifts that competitive advantage and there's no it's, it's, so it is, isn't uh, uh, the fact that these species are at the top of that list is no surprise is what I'm getting at. That earlier list I showed you of some of the more problematic weeds that we have. Now we can shift that. There's, again, the management can play into that. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the stocking rates, uh, the timing, one of the things I like personally like about rotational grazing from a weed management stand, standpoint, it allows that grass to rest for a period of time. And it's the root system underneath is as important as the top growth we see on top. 
in regards to that uh, ability of those plants, those desirable plants to, to recover. The other tool in the toolbox, and this is the one probably used most frequently or considered a lot for weed control. But you know, I think the bigger question is, is when do you mow? It's not the fact that we mow. In fact, the survey, the agent said they, 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 they observed that we probably mow one or two times a year in a grass pasture scenario. But when do you do that? Well, and my, there's not a clear-cut answer in my, my viewpoint because we have different weeds maturing at different times throughout the year. Why would we want to mow? Well, mowing has some other besides just weed control, but it also kind of helps maybe from a vegetative growth standpoint of our desirable species. But from, from a weed control perspective, mowing may, basically removes a lot of top growth. It's forcing that plant to continue, those weedy plants to to revitalize the top growth of those unwanted vegetation and as far as annual weeds especially if it can be timed right we can help reduce viable seed production. One of my observations is there's a lot of mowing goes on in the fall of the year. And what's that do? Yeah we wait until those seeds are fully mature and then we get out there with a mower and the mower runs up and around that pasture field and we're going to take those weed seed with us and we're going to volunteer to mow our neighbor's pasture and spread the wealth, right? Now that's an extreme. But anyway, you get my point, is that sometimes we are our worst enemies when it comes to propagating some of these problems. Now perennials can also be impacted. If you do it frequently, you can help deplete root reserves but for the most part, you probably are not going to reduce the populations. Once they're there, if they're able to come back from the root system, they're going to continue to be there. In fact, the case of tall iron weed, when you mow off that plant, when it comes up in the spring, you had one stem, you mow it off, and you might have four or five pop back. Now, they may not be as thrifty as that one stem, but at least we've got the capabilities. Main point is timing is important and trying to figure out when to best take advantage of that. From a chemical control standpoint for herbicides, most of our herbicide options we have available will target broadleaf weeds um, as far as the foliar treatments that we have available to us. And they can, some of them are quite effective, are doing a pretty fantastic job depending on how, you know, what direction you want to go with that, but uh, we can be quite effective. But keep in mind herbicides may be only a short term solution. We can kill out several of those weed species, and if they occupy a lot of space, what happens when those weeds die? We have bare spots, and more weeds grow on those bare spots. So it needs to be part of an overall program in order to get the most benefit from that. The agents indicated about 25% of they think of the pasture acres are now being sprayed, and this definitely is up from where I started over 35 years ago. Uh, when I first started work, we had some programs targeting thistles, uh, but we are now starting to target some of these weeds like buttercup, iron, ironweed, uh, cockleburr, and even poison hemlock is some of the top weeds that they indicated that are being targeted. What are some of those herbicides? Here's my quick uh, summary of what they are. Yes, there's a number of product names out there and everything more than what I have on the list, but it really boils down to about five or six active ingredients that are, that are there. Um, 2,4-D is still the, probably the foundation product in the chemistry that's in most products that are out there. There is a newer product called Freelix, which is a choline salt of 2,4-D. What makes that unique? It is the least volatile. It's a lower volatile product. I didn't say no, I said least volatile potential. So that's a plus to try to keep that one where we put it. Then the dicamba products, we primarily use things like Weedmaster, Rifle D. The dicamba 2,4-D combination kind of broadens the spectrum a little bit more of some of the weeds that we might be able to target. Then the triclopyr based products, things like Crossbow has been around for a number of years now in Pasture Guard. And then the suite of amino pyrrolid products that are currently available for us. Uh, the first one that came out was Forefront. 
that got rebranded or renamed to Grazon Next, which still 24D is a big driver in that product. Then we've had Chaparral, they take, added the Metsulfuron instead of 24D uh, as a possibility in that mix. And of course, that was also marketed for seed head suppression uh, as well. The newest one um, in that group is Duracore. Uh, Duracore still driven by amino pyrrolid plus this newer active called fluoropyroxifen. Uh, they've also branded that as Resicor uh, in that mix. They are working on uh, releasing another product that will be driven somewhat by that active ingredient as well. Anything that's got amino pyrrolid in it, I'd be concerned about it. You won't see it every year, but depending on when you applied it and how much moisture we've had between the time of application, but there's definitely has to be a window between those two in clover establishment, absolutely. Less so with these chemistries up here, which, which degrade pretty quick. You still need to wait. You can't do it immediately, but you need to. And then there's metsulfuron, and then we have some more niche herbicides, uh, things like uh, the contain halosulfuron, sold as two different actes. And then I've got Sharpen highlighted here. <clears throat> Sharpen was a, initially introduced as a, a soybean and a corn herbicide uh, for selective control of certain broadleaf weeds. Uh, it's now labeled for use on grass pastures. I've done a little bit of work with it, and some of you may have seen me share some of that data for cockleburr and ragweed control. And it's something we can use in the middle of the summer and not be as concerned about vapor losses. So if you've got fields that are kind of in some of those areas where you gotta be a little cautious about that. Uh, but Sharpen is not a complete herbicide in itself to control all those weeds we have. For perennials, you'll burn the leaves off it. It's a, it's a burner. In fact, where I did some of my initial work, the field, the whole field got sprayed and it looked like someone just went in and killed off everything. Well, it's because there's so many weeds in it that were, were being affected. So anyway, it's a niche uh, there, uh, but another option. <clears throat> now there's some issues that limit our herbicide use, uh, uses, and first and foremost is most of those are going to impact clover. I can tell you how to get rid of clover, at least for a year or two. Uh, but it'll eventually come back. But I think just as important, a lot of times timing of herbicide treatments is just as important as timing of mowing. Oftentimes we don't recognize we've got a problem until these plants are in full flowering stage. It's too late. Take buttercup, for example. When do people start getting excited about buttercup? Come late April, May, and early June when it's in full bloom. We should have done something about that back in late February or March. Buttercups now germinate. I've been in a couple of fields now. I've seen some buttercup already. Uh, sensitive crops, we've got to be aware of our surroundings. Uh, stewardship's an important part of that. Grazing restrictions, cause there is a cost, and that can be a little bit of a bite, but there's a cost of mowing too. And when I think about herbicides, it's not what I see the effectiveness of month after I've done it, what did it do for me two plus years, or at least a year to two years after I've, I've, I've uh, gone to that program? We got to think about reseeding forages. How long to wait? Uh, how long after you apply before you can reseed, like the question here in the back of the room? Uh, I've gotten a number of questions just in the last few weeks that are some newly seeded forage hay fields uh, where these winter annuals are encroaching and coming in, is that grass established enough that I can spray? What can I spray some of these, these uh, winter annuals with? And that can sometimes be a little, little bit of a challenge. <laughs> also keep in mind stewardship as far as what's in some of these herbicides, particularly the amino pyrrolid based products. You'll see this diagram in the front of that label. And that diagram's important because that chemistry whether it goes through the animal and through the manure or through hay that ends up as compost, end up on a sensitive crops, can cause problems. I'll give you a couple examples. This is an organic vegetable producer that was had a couple of hay bales that they were using for 
for mulching purposes around their organic crops. Well, that hay was produced two years before they acquired the hay. But that hay had been sprayed with an amino purely based product. And that chemistry was bound in that hay until it was exposed back to moisture and then released. And you have some highly sensitive, particularly solanaceous plants in which there's problems. Here's a tobacco field where they took the bedding out of uh, some horse stalls from hay that had been used in those, for that bedding and then uh, subsequently spread over a tobacco field. We've got a case this, just this summer where we, the, the, the evidence has pointed towards the possibility that some fertilizer that hadn't been impregnated with one of these herbicides somehow or another ended up contaminating a load of fertilizer that was spread on a tobacco field. And yes, this crop is devastated and it's probably going to impact that use of that area for at least three years, if not four or more, as far as being able to grow a crop like tobacco. So, oops, there are some things we have to be aware of in regards to stewardship of herbicide use. They're great tools. We just need to know where to use them and where, where, they, where they fit and where the limitations are. So I want to finish up here talking about a pasture study that I led uh, a few years back um, in which I wanted to look at these different factors I just got through talking about, a mechanical, chemical, and a cultural practice, specifically adding fertility, effects on weed populations and forage productivity or forage yield. So here's our three primary factors, and then we use combination of those factors as well. There's three locations that we had across the state uh, in which we did this. We ended up with eight treatments. So we also had an untreated control where we did nothing. And this was a three-year study. It was carried out during a three-year period. So there was one treatment that didn't get anything at, amended, the, the, uh, the management of the, that field. We had mowing by itself, which happened in midsummer. A herbicide application uh, in the fall. Added fertility was also done in the fall of the year. Uh, the soil scientist I was working with on this project, we debated a little bit, do we do the fertility in the spring or we do it in the fall? And we finally concluded that we want to do it in the fall because our objective was to promote the growth of the desirable species, the desirable grasses. So we wanted to try to enhance the root growth uh, as we go through that overwintering period. <clears throat> so then we had the combinations of those different factors. These were fairly large plots for doing replicated trials, particularly a study that has this many treatments in it. And again, it's uh, over a three year period. So I'm going to just share data from a couple of those sites. This is Anderson County. Again, we mowed in the middle of summer, mid July the first year, uh, early August the second year. The herbicide was applied in August, and the forefront's the same thing as Grazon, was applied in. Uh, there towards mid to late August, just the first year. We didn't put it on two years in a row with this particular site. The fertility, all the sites had, had 50 pounds of N added. This site was low in, in P, so we did add some, some DAP to amend uh, the, the phosphorus uh, at this site. If you look at the weed populations, and this table's a little bit busy, but I just want to just mainly put this up here. So the main weeds at this, this site was tall ironweed, goldenrod, and marsh elder, which we measured the, the uh, second year into the study or the year after all the treatments were applied. Marsh elder, if you're not familiar with it, is a plant, it's a summer, another summer annual that's growth habits very similar to cockleburr. They're in the same plant family, but it doesn't produce those burrs like a cockleburr does. It has a different reproductive uh, structure, but it's it's also in the same plant family though. So if you look at the untreated, and this is the number of plants per 100 square feet, and if you get over 10 per 100 square feet, you can tell you've got a pretty high population. Of, uh, and this, this was in the, and you can see the goldenrod actually went up, uh, as well the tall ironweed as well to a certain extent. Fertility didn't really change those numbers very much, all maybe a little bit less, but uh, they, they still stayed about the same. The biggest change was the herbicide treatment. So the four herbicide treatments here, we did impact weed populations. 
uh, for those three different species. Mowing, there's a little bit of reduction. Uh, again, mainly in the goldenrod, a little less so with, with the marsh elder uh, at the time we took these, uh, these evaluations. Uh, in, in September, this would have been um, about a year after all the treatments would have been applied. So the point is, we are having an impact on the weed populations with some treatments, but not all of them. Okay. If you look at the, what is the overall forage yield though for these eight treatments? Now the green bars represent the grass and the red bars represent the weeds. And as you can see, the untreated here, there's about a 60% grass to 40% weeds when those fields were left. And this is, this is the total of three harvest periods. I mean, take, took two in 2009 and one in, in 2010. If we look at the fertility, the amount of weeds stayed about the same, but we did increase the grass. In fact, one other side note is it was dry in the fall of 2008, we put that fertility on there. And some of that ammonia nitrate laid there before it even got its first uh, rainfall, by the way. Mowing didn't change the total biomass, but we had a few less weeds, a little more grass by mowing. The herbicides, we still had the weeds uh, mainly showing up into that second year. But again, as much grass growth as we had with fertility by itself, uh, mowing with herbicide, again about the same with a few less weeds even there. And certainly when we had fertility combined with each of the individual factors and or the, the uh, three-way, uh, we have fewer weeds uh, and certainly a lot more grass being produced by adding the fertility with, with the other treatments. Just to give you an idea what what this looked like at Anderson County, this would have been a mowing, at least with mowing with uh, uh, I mean, herbicide with fertility or the three-way, and this is the untreated. And as you can see, there's a mixture of different weeds in those plots that didn't get any input to change the system other than animals were allowed to graze this area uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. Monroe County, we actually had some clover. So we separated the clover as well as the grasses and the weeds. Here's the untreated again. If you look at the clover as a desirable species along with the grass, again, we kind of see that 60-40 mix of weeds to desirable forages. We get to the fertility. Again, this, the weeds didn't change that much. The clover really didn't change a whole lot, maybe a little bit, but we do have more grass produced. Mowing, we shift a little bit more towards clover, a few less weeds, a little bit of extra grass here. Here's our herbicide treatment. Total biomass is pretty close to uh, the untreated, but most of it's in grass instead of weeds. And then we have the, uh, the mowing and fertility. Again, the clover is about the same as fertility by itself. Uh, didn't really change the, the weed spectrum that much. Herbicide, fertility combination, uh, herbicide mowing, Without the fertility, obviously going to be a little bit lower than with fertility than the three-way mix. The biggest thing is there's two main points there with the herbicide treatments. Fewer weeds, no clover. But the amount of grass is certainly as good or better than the untreated. All right. If you take those four treatments that were mowed versus the four treatments that were unmowed and kind of look at it from a statistical standpoint, you can see again the total biomass didn't differ, the weed biomass didn't differ, and the amount of grass didn't differ. There's a little bit of a trend of a little more clover. Now one of the sites, the other site that had clover in it actually that was a little more statistically different between a little more clover where we mowed and didn't mow. And that was mowing with or without the other combination. So we're looking at four, four plus four comparison here. If you look at the herbicide effect, again, total biomass didn't, didn't differ between whether it had a herbicide or didn't have a herbicide. We certainly reduced the weed biomass for those harvest, two harvest periods that I've got represented here. No clover, and we had more grass than we had 
with the herbicide than we had without the herbicide. Do you look at fertility? Yes, we do have a biomass difference in this particular case. And that's mostly because of the increase in grass. Had little, no change in the clover compos uh, uh, com composition. But this was a pleasant surprise. It really didn't have an impact on more weed growth. And that was true for all three, three sites. Um, so we were pleased to, to see that because anecdotally through the years you hear about, well, I fertilize this pasture, I'm going to fertilize my weeds. Uh, that didn't happen, at least in those, those studies. So I want to finish up with just some general uh, conclusions and observations, uh, partly related to this, this study, but I think is some uh, other, other general observations that I've had through the years. Mowing alone does suppress weed top growth. Uh, may not always result in weed, reduced weed populations. With some annual weeds, like cockleburr, I think timely mowing can reduce that population. I mean, do it before you reproduce, because the cockleburr seed are not as long-lived as some of the other weeds that we have. And it may be the primary weed control option that we have, along with good grazing practices or the cultural practices that we can implement. Herbicides are useful for tackling some of our major problem weeds and can be cost effective if our objective is to produce more forage so we can graze more animals. I hope you understood what I'm saying there. If we've got a lot of extra grass, we may not need more grass. But if we need more grass in order to sustain more animals, this is at least another tool in the toolbox, and hopefully we can get at least two years of benefit out of that practice. If we've got situations where we have a drastic weed problem, then we can do that. Adding fertility is another way that we can increase the biomass, but it had a little effect on the weed biomass, which was a pleasant, uh, or was a, it was a good outcome that we had from those particular studies. But even as a final thought is, I think what we learned from those studies is, with no management, if we leave it alone, weed populations will increase, and desirable forages will decline. Uh, so it's important that we are doing something or other to try to help short change that, that process. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the weed management side of it is one of the later things that we think about until we are into a major problem. Then we want the quick fix. These weed problems I observe in these pa grazed pasture situations took a few years to get there. To get back where we want is not going to be a quick fix. It may take us a few years to get back there and implementing just different things. Hopefully what I've done and I've, a lot of groups I've talked to is I, I'm just trying to throw out a few nuggets for people to think about and figure out how they may fit into your particular situations that you're dealing with. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I don't have any anything I can pull up quickly, but I think some of the work that's been done uh, points probably a little bit more towards, yes, certain plants do better under different fertility levels. Yes, in, in one respect. And the other part of that, though, was I reviewed a paper a few years back on broom sedge control. And the, the, the conclusion over this multiple-year study was the amount of fescue and the desirable forages in that in that where they corrected the pH really wasn't much different than where the broom sedge, where they did not do the fertility to correct it. It's just there's more competitive advantage for the fescue to take more advantage of it because that, the fertility was optimized for the fescue growth, allowed it to be, be much more dominant in that mix, in that particular uh, vegetative mix. Uh, I can't put my hand on lots. There's been a little bit of work done in that area. I just can't pull it up here quickly. 
Any other comments, questions? I have uh, had the opportunity to, to look at it a little bit the last couple years. Uh, of course, they, their announcement was supposed to have been available by now, and that's, that's real typical. With pesticide registrations just don't happen overnight sometimes. I mean, it just takes a while for them to get to the system. What is this? Well, they're calling it ProClova. Well, as I kind of alluded to, it's got this Resicor active ingredient plus another active ingredient. And they're calling it ProClova, but if you read the fine print, it's gonna be safe on white clover, not red clover. So if you're looking for something for red clover protection, this is not gonna do it. No, is there any work going on to select the red clover that's maybe calling for Well, for years, uh, I actually went back with Dr. Norm Taylor, who's, uh, used to be in our department, uh, started a project where he was trying to select a red clover variety that would have more tolerance to 2,4-D. That work is, has continued. Uh, actually, we have a graduate student, part of our program, that's uh, is doing that as part of his PhD project. So still trying to move in that direction, but this, is, this has been in the works 10 or 12 years or more. I mean, that, you know, trying to use natural selection to get you there is... It's a long, drawn-out process, and it, there's still still not something quite yet. I don't think to bring to the marketplace. I think they feel like they're getting close, but okay. So cocklebur is a species. There's two things I think drives that. But one of them, cocklebur does like wetter environments. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons it's, you know, when I did some work three years back, cocklebur was pretty dominant. And then last year I didn't see much, you know, it was pretty sparse, and then this year, here we go again. The other thing is a lot of your cocklebur, heavier populations are going to be in those areas where you have bare spots, or areas where you don't have good, good growth. And, when I see cockleburr and I see ragweed and I even see this foxtail out in these pasture fields uh, and hay fields to that extent, there are indicators. Talking about indicators relative to, to, to uh, fertility, there are indicators, in my opinion, of our desirable forages are not occupying as much of that space, which goes back to hopefully one of the points I left with you today the importance of managing your desirable species to uh, get them established and try to maintain them the best we can. And then we have those dry years and we've done all that work and that, that kind of goes against that. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Dr. Brady.